Good morning, Central Baptist. Stand if you would. Let's sing. I stand amazed in the presence. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. How Good morning. good morning it's a good day to be in the house of the lord Amen. this afternoon we have a the bulletin says we have a budget committee meeting at five o'clock i am postponing that until 5 15. we need a missions committee meeting at five o'clock to discuss uh, what we're going to do what kind of support we'll give sean schroeder so if you would remember that mission committee five o'clock budget committee 515 after that six o'clock we have ice cream fellowship i love them <laughs> you know a man's got his priorities right when he says lord let me live one more day so i can enjoy ice cream fellowship <clears throat> and the ice cream fellowship we will be singing some Give you the opportunity to sing a special if you want to and give you testimony scriptures tell us in psalms 107 let the redeemed of the lord say so so tonight if you are been redeemed i want you to give god the glory uh, tell tell people around you what he's done for you uh, give god glory i don't see any other announcements that are important enough to take up your time this morning uh, you do have the bulletin is there any prayer prayer requests we need to make mention of? Remember Harriet Jackson, our secretary. She's having some heart cath done Tuesday, but she's been under the weather all week, so be praying for her. Any others? Any others? Bow with me for prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day and the opportunity we have to worship you. Father, we pray that uh, you would so convict our hearts, so move in our life that we find you worthy of worship and praise, that we would give you honor and glory, Father, and sing to you and give testimony to you. We thank you, Father, for the fellowship that we have one with another and the love of Christ that is shared abroad in our lives. We thank you for the 
love that you've shown us through your son Jesus Christ and we ask Lord that today if there's any here that does not know the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ that today you would show them make them aware of their great need and Father give them the courage and the ability to make the right decision we ask Father for the prayer request for Miss Harriet Jackson and for Joe Pennington that you would move in their life and that You'd provide all that they need for the healing and that they'd give honor and glory to you for it. Lord, we ask now that you guide us and you give Brandon the words you'd have him to sing and Titus the song. Brandon's going to preach, Lord. He's not going to sing. We pray that you give him the words that he needs and to get us your message. We ask that you guide and direct us and it's in Christ's name. Amen. You're never too old to come up here. Come on up, guys. Good to see all of you. Now, last time I talked to you, I kind of talked about a pretty serious little matter, about the Ten Commandments a little bit, and I kind of asked you all to be quiet. But today, you feel free to take part, okay? I'm opening it up for you today. Now, i got a question for you. I know school's out, and tests are behind us, but i got a little test question for you to start off with, okay? Let's see who can answer this. Normally when we finish talking, and I pray, and you go see Brother Tracy, and he gives you a lifesaver because Jesus Christ is our lifesaver, right? What do I always tell you to do? Say what? Say thank you. Okay, that's important. And all of us need to learn to say thank you to people more than we do our pastors for their sermons our song leader for the music our pianists your Sunday school teachers we need to say thank you they put in a lot of effort for that today I have brought with me some thank you cards you thought this what money what do we need money for Oh, good gracious. Anyway, this is a thank you card that was sent to my wife. Okay. And here's another thank you card. You see, she must be doing a lot of really good things. I want you all to look at this. And in fact, I'm going to let somebody read this. I'm going to let you lead it. Okay. I want you to read this thank you card right there. <laughs> you have a little trouble reading it, aren't you? Oh, well, let's see if you can. Can you read any of it? Uh, read two or three words real loud. Okay. It is a little hard to read. <laughs> He's having a hard time. This was written by a four-year-old. So y'all get the message. But it's a four-year-old that sent Allison a thank you card for her their birthday gifts. I think that's awful sweet, isn't it? Handwritten by a four-year-old. Okay? Here's a thank you card that my wife and I wrote to my principal for some things that he had done for me this year. Uh, I had to rewrite it because we made a error. Y'all don't ever make errors, do you? Oh, we do? Okay. <laughs> we misspelled a word on this one, so we had to rewrite it, and that's the reason I have this one here. But I have one more thank you card here. Yeah, you can read it. Ah, blank? I mean there's nothing there? It just says thank you and there's nothing there? Well, that's not much of a thank you card, is it? Well, 
Let me tell you what I was going to do. <laughs> Y'all may have to help me a little bit, okay? I was going to write Jesus a thank you card. But you know what? I didn't know what his address was. Does he have a post office box? Does he have a zip code? If I send this and say to Jesus in heaven, do you think the post office is going to deliver it? Well, then how do we say thank you to Jesus? Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit. Tell us. We need to know. There you go. Fly a rocket up to heaven. <laughs> Praise to him. Okay. What can we do? Give it to a bird and that bird fly up there? It's going to be a long flight. <laughs> what do you have? Can what? Pray. I bet you that's going to be part of my lesson where you want to say. Okay, let me ask you all a couple of questions real quick. Yeah, okay. If if one of your friends invited you to come over and spend the night and you went, what might you do later on? Yeah. Huh? Say thank you. Say thank you. Obviously, that's what we're talking about. So you'd tell them thank you. But you might also do one other thing. Invite them, invite them to come what? To come to your house and spend the night with you sometimes. Same thing. If they asked you to go to the movies with them, you'd go and you'd say thank you, but then later you might ask them to come and go to the movies with you. Okay? You know, in our world today, and if y'all want to follow along with me, congregation, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. Okay? We don't have anyone that's done more for us than God. True? Nothing. God and Jesus Christ, they take care of us, okay? They provide water, food for us when we're hungry, when we're thirsty. They take care of us when we're sick. And the Bible tells us that they're an ever-present helper. So the question I had to y'all, how do I say thank you? Well, in Matthew, it says that this, whatever you do for one of these of uh, my brothers of mine you do for me so what that means is this when you see someone who is hungry and you feed them you're doing it to Jesus when you see someone that is sick and you go and visit them you're doing it for who Jesus when you give clothes to people that are in need who are you doing it for you're doing it for Jesus now we said thank you for our goal, but those examples are what we call thanks living. Now, I didn't say thanksgiving. I said thanks living. We are living what Jesus tells us to do, okay? And by our actions, Jesus gets our thank you notes. Not in the mail, not mailed to heaven with no zip code. But he gets our message that we love him because we are doing thanks living to other people in our lives. Okay? That's how we get there. Okay? That's how we get there. All of us need to do a better job in thanks living. Everybody in this building right now is so blessed. We can't even comprehend how blessed we are. First of all, just being allowed to be here in America and having freedom to attend church. You know, there's a lot of people in the world, they had to go into secret hiding places to go to church. Isn't that, isn't that bad? But we don't. We don't have to do that, do we? Our doors are always open, okay? God is always here with us. He's here right now. He's touching some of y'all. In fact, Brother Tracy's already alluded to it a while ago. I'm waiting because I know one of you are going to walk up here and take Brother Tracy by the hand 
and say you want Jesus Christ to come and live in your heart. It means a lot to me. You can tell that right now, can't you? I know it's going to happen. I'm waiting for it to happen. And it may be somebody out there today, but it's going to happen, okay? Yes, sir. Can you ask him? I know it. You and your sister both. That was a blessing, a blessing day. And we're looking for more blessings, okay? Congregation, today may be your day. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Come today. The invitation is always open. If you want to come, get up and come right now. Brother Tracy will stand up and meet you. I guarantee you. Let's pray, guys. And then I have some candy for you. And you can get some out of my bag. And then you can go over there and see Brother Tracy. And what are you going to say? Thank you. Okay, let's pray first. Okay. God, <clears throat> I do thank you for these children. And what a true blessing they are, Lord. I pray that you take care of them. And when the time is right, when it's your time, Lord, you just touch their hearts and allow them to come forth. And if there's anyone here today that needs to know you as their personal Savior, I just say, come today. Thank you for our church and our church family. And we ask that you continue to bless us and watch over us and forgive us where we have failed you. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, now, I've got some bags of candy here. Y'all get, not you don't get a whole bag. You just reach in there and get two or three pieces out and then you go over there and see Brother Tracy and get a lifesaver because Jesus Christ is our lifesaver. Okay? Stand if you would, let's sing I Stand Amazed in the Presence.
almost sang that song twice, didn't you? Or I did. Ancient words ever true, changing me. They should be changing both of us, should they?
temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Oh, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And Lord, I opportunities we have in this country, Lord, to stand here this morning, to praise, to worship you, Lord, to lift our voices to you. Dear God, thank you for that opportunity. And as Brother Brandon comes to speak this morning, Lord, would you speak to him, speak through him, and may we have ears and hearts to hear. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Children, follow Miss Devon. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind but now I see <laughs> okay. I, thought, I thought maybe uh, uh, brother Tracy was prophesying or something that, that was meant to be okay all right uh, good morning uh, glad that you're here this morning glad that you've chosen to come and worship with us if you got your Bibles going to open up to Luke chapter 15 it's where we're going to spend a majority of our time today. Um, let, me, let me start off by saying a few things. Um, one, if you are a father and you were not here last week, I would highly encourage you to go back, go to our YouTube channel and watch Brother Jason's message on fatherhood from last week. It highly convicted uh, me about the importance of a father. Just a just few days or a few it's been probably about a few months ago. I got done working out, and I was really tired and just really sweaty and just exhausted, and I just laid down on the floor in our living room, just laid down, didn't want to move or nothing. And Judah comes up, and our youngest son, he's, he's about a year old, and he just starts crawling back and forth over my legs. And he's laughing, he's crawling, he's sliding. Uh, Bishop, uh, my oldest, comes over, 
and just starts jumping back and forth over me. And he's like, Mama, watch me. Mama, watch me. And I'm literally laying there, and I'm thinking, man, my kids are having a great time, and I am putting in about the least amount of effort I possibly can as a father in this moment. But just my presence in this moment is good for them. And so the presence of a father, the impact a father has, I would highly encourage you to just go back and listen to that message because it was amazing. Um, Today, I want to talk about something that God really convicted me of yesterday. And I want to start off by asking this. Are there any beach people in here? Like, you, you love going to the beach, like, that, that's your thing, like, uh, you, you just love spending time at the beach. I, I, I like going to the beach. Uh, we got any people that are, like, beach people, but you're not getting the water people? Uh, okay, all right, a few, okay, all right. Um, and so me and Brittany, we got, I, I like the beach. I like to go out as deep as I can, right? Um, and, and Brittany's like, oh, I'm not going to, I'll, I'll dip a toe in, you know, like, that kind, that kind of thing. Um, well, I, w- I want to tell uh, about a time, and so... A lot of you have been praying for my brother, and I really appreciate that. I want to tell you um, about a time me and my brother didn't grow up uh, together. Uh, he grew up with my mom in Houston, and I used to go down there and visit them. And I want to tell you about one of the times that I went to the beach. We, we used to go to Galveston, which is kind of like a beach, right? And so we used to go to Galveston, and, and so we, we would go to Galveston together. I remember one time we went to Galveston together. Uh, it was me, my brother, my sister, and my mom, and so she took us down there, and so we, I was really excited, because I got like snorkeling gear, right, uh, I, got, I got a mask, I, I didn't know that you couldn't like snorkel in Galveston water, you know, but I, I, got a, I got a mask, and I was so excited, and so we went to the beach, and so we got there, we set up our, we parked, we set up camp, and we began to go out in the water and play. My mom told us, you know, don't go too far out, out into the water and everything. And so we began to go out into the water and play. And so I got my little glasses on, and I'm like, man, I, I want to see a fish, you know. And so I'm going, like, under the water, can't see anything. But I'm just, you know, we're having a good time. We're out there playing, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. Um, and then we realized, okay, it's been a little bit. We probably need to make our way back to, to mom. And so... We begin to make our way back to the shore, and we notice something. We notice that my mom has left. And so kind of a, I'm like, mild panic, you know, like she was right there. She was, why wouldn't she tell us that she left? Uh, like all her, she's left, and not only has she left, like she took all, of her, all our stuff with her. Like that's gone too. I look out where we parked, the car's not there. And I'm like, that's interesting. You know, like, okay, like, what do I do? Like, I'm the oldest. Like, I got to take charge. And so I'm like, okay, children. You know, like, I'm planning, like, how this is going to go, how I'm going to lead my brother and sister back to my mom's house in Houston, you know, like. um, And then I noticed, like, when we pulled up, there was, like, a big red motel that was there. I remember looking at that, and it was gone, too. Like, it had left, too. And I'm like, what is going on? And then I realized something. Like, as we began to play out in the water and, the, and deeper we got, we began, over the course of the time we were out there, we just slowly drifted away from where we had started. And the water just began to just slowly take us, and we had drifted about maybe a quarter of a mile down from where we originally started. And it was just so surreal to me in that moment. And I, we walked back, found our mom, and, but we didn't realize that we were drifting as it was going on. So what I want to talk about this morning is are we drifting and not realizing it? Are we drifting away from God and maybe not be aware that we're actually drifting away from God and how can we tell? And what I want to do this morning is I want to look at a story, a very popular story within Scripture. It's called the parable of the prodigal son. And as I've, as I've always looked at the story, I've always looked at myself in light of the, of the prodigal son. And so I've always kind of connected with the prodigal son, with the younger brother in the story, that that is kind of my testimony, if you've ever heard it, it is very younger brother-ish. And so I've always kind of connected with that. And as I began to study this passage yesterday, if you're familiar with the story, it's about a father who has a young son, but he also has another son. There's a younger brother in the story, but there's also an older brother. And so as I began to read this story, God pointed out to me that I have some older brother tendencies in my life that I did not realize. 
and I have been drifting without even realizing it. And so God revealed some stuff to me yesterday that I, I just want to kind of share with y'all this morning. And my preaching philosophy, I say it all the time, if God's taking me down, I'm taking y'all with me. And so this is, this is what, what God has been teaching me. And so I, what I want to do this morning is just talk about this, because if we're honest, some of us here, we, we are drifting from God. Because at one point we were just so close, and we can remember those times where we were so close, so connected with God, everything was great. And then it's been years, have months, days, years have passed, and we look up and we're not as connected anymore, and we wonder, you know, what happened? How did we get here? Why are we drifting? And the scariest part about drifting is that we oftentimes don't realize that we're doing it, and we fall into kind of this, the same patterns over and over and over again, and that leads us to drifting away from God. And what I want to do today is look at a very specific group of people in scriptures, the Pharisees. And I think that if we're not careful, we have tendencies that can lead us to drift off and become almost like a Pharisee, It'll cause us to become like the older brother in the story. If you don't know who the Pharisees are, uh, they were the religious elite of the day. Jesus had a lot of problems with them. If you read in Scripture, when Jesus is talking uh, to people, when we, Jesus would always hang out with sinners, with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with all, all these people who were the marginalized of society, and he would always deal with them with uh, kindness and tenderness. But when he dealt with the Pharisees, with the people who uh, were focused on, on religion, but not a relationship with God, and were very proud in their, in the, in their, re, in their religion, that he was always almost hostile towards them. He would call them the broad of vipers. He would, he would, if you read when he dealt with them, there's a lot of exclamation, part, exclamation points when he is dealing with the Pharisees. And so, but in this story, Jesus is going to take almost a kind of a kind tone with them. It's one of the only times in scriptures. And I want to examine our lives compared to theirs and just ask us this morning, are we drifting and not realizing it? So if you got your Bibles, Luke chapter 15 is, is where we're going to be. And before we get there, let me, let me start off and let me just ask you some questions and see if any of this, and you don't have to raise your hand, you know, none, nothing like that. I just want you to consider these questions. Um, and maybe, maybe this is kind of a sign that we have drifted. Uh, first question is, do you find yourself short-tempered at the way things turn out? Like, do you find yourself often getting angry at the way things turn out? Like, it wasn't supposed to be this way, and so you just start getting angry at kind of the way that things turn out in your life. Two, do you find it difficult to celebrate the success of others? Do you often think when somebody has success that that should have been me? And three, and here's a big one. And listen, if this question, if the answer to this question is no, I'm glad you're here this morning. Tune in to what God has to say this morning. But the third question is just simply this, do you enjoy God? Do you enjoy God? So let's get to this passage. And listen, if you, if you, if you looked at those questions, I'm glad that you're here this morning. If there if they were something in there that applied to you, I'm glad that you're here this morning. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11, we're going to get the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, let me kind of just summarize the first little part of this. We have a, a father who has two sons. A, a younger brother comes up to his father and says that I want my inheritance now. And, and the father gives him his inheritance. It says he takes it and he squanders it on foolish living. And uh, it says that as, as he begins to, he squanders all of his inheritance and he ends up living with the pigs. Uh, li literal pigs. He ends up living in a pigsty, and he, he said it kind of came to his senses one day, and he realized that his father's hired helpers have uh, better living conditions than I do. Maybe I can go back and beg and plead with my father, and, and he will forgive me, and he will allow me to be one of his servants again. And so it says he begins to go back on the long road home to his father. It says, but when he got close enough, it's when his father saw him. It says his father runs out to him, welcomes him. He's going to end up celebrating. He's going to throw a party. He's going to kill the fattened calf. And that's where I want to pick up the story. In verse 22, it says, but the father 
said to his servants, the son has come home. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate for this for this my son was dead and is alive again. He is lost and is found and they begin to celebrate. Listen, this is a beautiful picture of what it looks like when, when, when somebody repents, when somebody turns to God, that there, there is a celebration, that there is a party um, in the youth building. Uh, when we have a, a child that um, makes a decision to surrender their life to God, uh, we always play one song each time this happens, um, and I cannot ever remember who sings it, but it's the like old song, celebrate good times, because I want to teach them that when somebody turns over their lives, when God saves somebody, that is time to celebrate. Like, I want them making that connection in their head that that is a celebration, because that's what's going on in heaven, and we're called to make, what is it? Okay, I thought, okay, and we're called to make that connection that, that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a celebration. And so this is a beautiful picture of what it looks like when somebody, when somebody repents, when somebody turns to God. Beautiful picture of what, what the Father does in those moments. And oftentimes we cut the story off there. But the story doesn't end there. And in this story... When Jesus tells this story, it says that he is hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. But when he tells this story, he is not telling the story to them. If you look back at the beginning of Luke chapter 15, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawn near to him, speaking about Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And it says, So Jesus told them this parable. So this parable is addressed not to tax collectors and sinners, but to Pharisees. And the story doesn't stop at the younger brother. There's an older brother in the story. What Jesus is about to do is he's about to take the Pharisees and place them in the story. It's like if you remember in the Old Testament, David, uh, he, he kills Uriah, takes his wife. And so Nathan, a prophet, is going to come up to him. And he's going to say, hey, there was a, a king who had hundreds of sheep, but he takes one of these sheep from, from this old poor man and, and takes it for himself. And David begins to freak out. He's like, who is this man? I'll have him killed. And Nathan looks at him and says, you are that man. And so he takes him and he places him in the story. And Jesus is going to do this to the Pharisees in this moment. He's going to take them. He's going to place them into the story. And so the story picks up in verse 25. It says, now the older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your commands. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And it really feels like there should be like 10 more verses to the story, but it just kind of ends there with the older brother not getting into the party. And so I want to look at the older brother this morning and examine our lives and ask us if we have drifted the same way this older brother has drifted. Um, let you know just real quick what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at three things that I believe that aren't like big things but can lead us to drift and they're present in an older brother's lifestyle and it's anger, pride, and envy. Anger, pride, and envy. Um, sins of anger, pride, and envy are dangerous and, and, and can destroy us because we can be thinking we're doing all the things right. We're not doing the big sins like the younger brother but we're in just, we're just this lost as the younger brother, in that moment. And so the father comes in, and he's going to plead with him. And he said, this is amazing news. Your brother, who, 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 was, who was, we thought he was dead, is alive again. He's back. Let's party. 
And so the, and then the younger brother tells him that, listen, that I have been here the whole time. I, I have been here. I have been serving you. I've been here. I've been faithful. And you never threw me a party. I never even got a goat. Which is a weird thing. All right. And listen, in this moment, he focuses on what the father has not done instead of what the father's been doing. And too many times we fall prey to that same trap. And we focus on what God has not done for us instead of all the things that God has done for us. And I love, I hate how he responds, but I love how the father responds. Because if you notice, when speaking of the younger brother, he doesn't call him his brother. He says, this son of yours. This son of yours. And I love how the father reminds him, no, this brother of yours. This brother of yours. So we see him get angry. And listen, anger is a sign that you have drifted from God. Anger is a sign that you have drifted from God. And this is something I struggle with because I, I, anybody out there struggle with anger, just get angry really easily. Um, just me. Okay, all right. So, all right. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you right now, um, a lot of people assume that because I, I, I'm, I'm – Mid 30s, people assume that I, because I'm young ish, that I am good with technology, but I am not. All right. And so technology makes me so angry. There's nothing that just kind of makes me angrier than when something technologically is supposed to work and it does not. And I don't know the reason and I'm trying to solve it, but I can't figure it out. And so that just frustrates me. Like when the, uh, our internet just like decides it doesn't want to work anymore, or my cell phone decides it doesn't want to work. Just stuff like that just frustrates me. Traffic. Man, I live in Thornton, Texas for a reason. And so when I go to bigger cities, I'm like, wait, if we were all driving 70 right now, we wouldn't be sitting here. You know, like, what is going on? And so just, there's so many things in this world that just stir up my anger. And as I begin to think about anger and look at the younger brother, I mean, we look at the fruit of the Spirit. They're all kind of in contrast to anger, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, they're all kind of in stark contrast to anger. And so this is what the Spirit is supposed to be producing in us, and anger is coming out of me. What does that say? And I had to examine my life and look and say that maybe I've drifted farther than I actually think. Because I've got, I've got anger. Psalm 1611. Pull it up real quick says that you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. That if you're, you're in God's presence, you got the fullness of joy. Nehemiah 8.10 says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Look at this younger brother. The, just the foundation of his anger is just simply, God, you're doing it wrong. This is not how it's supposed to be. Father, you're not doing it right. Listen, this is not how it's supposed to go. If I was doing it right, I would have gotten the calf a long time ago. And so you're doing it wrong. That I can do it better. And listen, oftentimes we fall guilty of the same thing, of thinking we know better than God, of thinking we could do it better than God. Tim Keller, one of my favorite pastors, has a quote that says, Worry is, fearful, is being fearful that God is going to get it wrong, and bitterness is believing that he did. That worry is being fearful that God is going to get it wrong and bitterness or anger is believing that he did. So many times when we have anger in our lives, it's it's a result of believing that God has gotten something wrong. That this is not the way it's supposed to go. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And oftentimes we kind of play anger off as kind of cute or if it's just something, I'm just an angry person. It's just the way that I am. No, listen, it it is not. Ephesians... um, 427, what, what anger will do is it'll give a foothold to Satan in your life and he will conquer you because of it. Ephesians 4, 20, 26 and 27 says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. That listen, that when we have anger in our lives, it gives Satan an opportunity to conquer us, to get a hold of our lives. James 1, 19 through 20 says that, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And listen, this anger just causes, just dwells up inside of us and causes us to do just so many things. And you know something else I've figured out that's done in my life? Um, it's, causing, it's caused me to um, have my heart grow cold to people that are far from God. 
And let, let me tell you what I mean by that. And this is something me and Brittany kind of discussed a little bit yesterday as I was thinking about it. Um, this, this month of June uh, is known as Pride Month. Um, and so it's just, as I've been going throughout the month of June and just seeing things, it's made me angry. Like we're part of a nation that's celebrating sin. Like it should not be like this. And it's just made me frustrated. And I've told you before, I like Twitter. I know Brother Tracy likes Twitter, so I like Twitter. And so uh, Twitter has like promoted ads that they'll put in just everything promoted. It's been for Pride Month, and I've been deleting and blocking and just all this kind of stuff. And every time I see a rainbow, I'm like, that's not how a rainbow is supposed to be used. That's a sign of a promise for God. And, you know, and just, it's, it's been just making me angry this month. And so what it has caused me to do is see people who would identify with a homosexual lifestyle as being angry at their sin. It's caused me to be angry at them and not thinking that they're a person in the desperate need of the grace of God that is far from God. It has caused me to look at them in light of their sin and not as a person who is far from God. And so yesterday as I was going over this, I realized this, and I prayed for God to forgive me. And so what I've been doing is now when these ads start popping up, I still block them, but I'll take times to pray for the people that I see in the ads, that God will get a hold of their lives. And I'll take times to pray that God will break that because they're stuck in a very unhealthy and a very unbiblical lifestyle. But it's caused my heart, what anger will do is it'll cause your heart to grow cold towards those who are far from God. We've got to be careful that we don't let it. And what it did to the older brothers, it caused his heart to grow cold to the, towards the younger brother. And so a sign that you've got anger kind of controlling your lives is how do you view people who are far from God? Do you see them for their sin or do you see them in somebody in desperate need of the grace of God? Because oftentimes we forget that we were once one of those people in desperate need of the grace of God. And so he, he goes on, and just real quick, let me, let me get through these last little things. Okay, he says that, uh, he says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I've done this, I've done that. And what's he doing? He's telling him his resume, which you ever want to make God laugh, tell him your spiritual resume, right? But he tells him his resume, he starts scoreboarding, right? This, this is what I've done. Uh, and so we see that pride is an issue in his life. Pride is an issue in his life. Pride is another sign that you have drifted far from God. He says, I have been slaving for you, but here's the thing. If this is our attitude, God, I've been slaving for you. Here, here's the thing. God doesn't want a slave. He wants a son. He wants a daughter. God is not out after slaves. Acts 17, verse 24 through 25 simply tells us that God who made the world and everything in it being the lords of the heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God does not need us to do anything. It's like when, when we're carrying in the groceries. And listen, here's the thing. God does not need us but he desires us. He loves for us to help. But God does not need us to accomplish his purposes. It's like when we're carrying in the groceries at my house, I am fully capable of carrying in all the groceries. But do I love when Bishop comes and gets a bag, and he always somehow picks up the most heaviest bag that he can find and lets us know. It's, uh, as he's carrying it in, I'm like, do I do that? Like, what, what is the deal? Like, where does he learn that? And, but I love when he gets a part of it, but I don't need him to do that. I can do that. And God doesn't need us to do that. He's not looking for a slave. He's looking for a son. He's looking for a daughter. Galatians 4, 7 says that, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then you're an heir through God. You're an heir. You're not an employee. You're an heir. You have an inheritance through God. It's like, how many of y'all uh, hated mowing the grass when you were younger? Anybody in here just hate mowing the grass when you're young? All right, man, I am all alone today. All right, and so uh, how many of y'all love mowing the grass now? Anybody love mowing the grass now? Okay, a few of y'all. Let me just say, I, I was not a fan of, like, mowing the grass when I was younger um, because, like, you know, it's like you're, 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 you have to, right? And, like, you're doing it for the man, right? And so you're, you're mowing the yard. Um, but when you're older, and I, I've come to know, I love mowing our yard. Me and Brittany, like, fight over who's going to mow. Like, <laughs> I, I, I love mowing. And here's the thing. It's my yard. It's kind of been the difference. Like, it's my yard. I take pride in it. Right? It's my yard. 
And listen, are you working for God as a slave? Or are you working and building the kingdom that you're going to live in forever, that you're a part of this kingdom? And a quick way to just tell is, do you expect something in return? That when you do stuff for God, do you expect something in return? That do you want the Father or do you want His stuff? Because listen, you cannot be grateful for anything that you feel entitled to. You can't be grateful for something you feel entitled to. God wants a grateful heart. And so we see the younger brother talking about this. You never gave me a goat. I never got this. And so we see that pride is taking over. And we also see that, that envy is taking over. Envy is simply when envy is a sign that you have drifted far from God. Envy is when someone else gets what you thought you were entitled to. Let me ask you a quick question. What do you deserve? And I, I, know, I know that, like, hell, I deserve hell. I, yes, and so that, that, that's not what I'm talking about. All right, but um, what, let me ask you this, and just be real with yourself for a second. What do you think you deserve? Could it be a family, kids, health, a healthy marriage, a vacation, kids, well-behaved kids? Promotion, finances, like what is it that you think you deserve? You know, we have these things that we feel like we deserve. In reality, and the simple truth of the matter is, is we don't spend enough time thinking about eternity. When we realize that we're, we're an heir, that everything is coming our way, that we are freed up, that all of our greatest desires are fulfilled in him because of nothing we did, but because of everything that he did, that uh, no matter what we go through now, we have eternity, that a hundred years from now we are celebrating with God, that a hundred thousand years from now we're celebrating with God, that a hundred million years from now we are celebrating with God, that all, is, all, of, all that's his is ours. When we realize that, that, that he has given us all this, that he has not only given us his inheritance, that he's given us his self, his son on the cross, like what more do we have to ask for? When we become envious, it's a sign that we have drifted far from God, that we're not near him, because when we're near him, we realize that he has given us more than we ever deserve. So the father pleads with them. The son, that listen, all I have is yours. It just come, come into the party. The story just kind of ends without the older brother getting into the party. So in conclusion today, that listen, that anger, if you have anger in your life, it's a sign that you've drifted far from God. That pride, if we have pride in our lives, it's a sign that we have drifted far from God. And we have envy in our lives, it's a sign that we have drifted far from God. That day on the beach, when I got, got back to my mom, let me tell you what I didn't ask her. Where were you? I didn't ask her where she was. Why? She never left. She never moved. When I was um, younger, uh, I grew up with my grandparents. I really liked to explore in the woods, and so I kind of had everything mapped out. We lived on a little over 30 acres, and so I, I liked to just explore the woods, go look on all the land and kind of stuff. And... I remember one time, I, I kind of got turned around. And so I was younger, uh, and there was a time in my life that uh, I, was, I was a, a heavy set child. And so uh, it began to get dark, and I began to kind of panic, right? Like, I'm, I'm about to be a snack for something that lives out here in these woods. And so I began to kind of freak out a little bit, and so I began just kind of searching. Uh, and the sun began to go down, and in, in, in those moments when you hear like rustling in the woods, you know, it's probably like a bunny, but it sounds just like, you know, just going, and, and it's a scary thing going on, uh, and so I began to run, but I can't run far, and so I stop, catch my breath, run again, and so I'm just freaking out trying to find something that looks familiar, and then all of a sudden I hear something, I hear my grandfather's voice, and he's calling my name. And I begin to run back through the woods, and I find my way back 
to him because he was calling. Just like on that beach that day, my mom never moved. And when we drifted far from God, he doesn't move. We tend to drift, but he stays right where he is. And he calls out to us, come back, come home. And if you've caught yourself drifting in whatever way possible today, he is calling you to come home, to be back within his presence. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for all the ways that you love us, all the ways that you bless us, Lord. God, I pray today that we could examine our lives, Lord, and that we could look and we could see of any way that we might have drifted. Any way that we might be far from you and not even just realize it, Lord, but we look up and we say, this is not where I'm supposed to be. I don't know how I got here, but I know I'm not near you. And then, Father, our, our test would be repentance, just turning back and running towards you. Whether we're the younger brother, older brother, whatever it is, whichever way that we have drifted, we would just turn back, hear you calling, and run to you. Father, I love you. I thank you and I praise you. And it's in, your, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.